All right. All right. Yeah. So welcome. We're going to be talking about the four Gospels this morning. But before we do that, let's go to Heavenly Father, a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we are again mindful of you and your presence in our lives and everything you have done for us, the blessings we enjoy in this life, the fellowship we have with one another and with you and with your son. May we continue to grow in our knowledge and understanding of your word, the things you've left recorded for us that would help us to know you, to know your son, Jesus, to know what we ought to do in order to glorify your name. We pray this day that it would be again instructive to us, that would help us, but also help us that we can reach out to people who don't know you, to share your love, your kindness, your mercy, your salvation with people around us, that together we might glorify you and spend eternity with you. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. How many of you like biographies, help reading biographies? Do you? Okay. Not many. Okay. I, I, I do. Okay. Um, I grew up reading lots and lots of biographies. Okay. What, what, basically when you think about a biography, what is a biography? Okay. Story of their life. Okay. So what kind of things when you read a biography, you normally find in there then? Okay. Okay. All right. You find the background to them, maybe their upbringing and stuff, maybe what kind of get into whatever line of work they were doing or whatever. Okay. Okay. Other things? Oh. Their past experience. Okay. Their past experience they've gone through. Okay. Lorely. Okay. Successes and failures. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Sometimes their wishes and desires. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah, and there's there's lots of biographies out there. I grew up reading lots of biographies. I remember in elementary school, there was this author, Clara Ingram Judson. I just loved her work. She wrote lots of biographies about people of early American history. And I loved reading in elementary school. And when I got into college and later, I went back to an elementary school and I found one of her books and realized, oh, these are probably more fictional than true because it was written in more conversational style. We don't have probably the recording of a lot of conversations, historical people. But she put it in the context of conversation, made these people real, and it made it live and interesting to me. And so I got very interested in that. But even since, I enjoyed reading biographies. I like to know about people and their background. And as you guys have mentioned, why they do the things they do, how they get into them, and so forth. So I learned a lot. And when we think about the gospel accounts, we've got four of them. And to some degree, they're biographical. But what... What's different? What sets the gospel accounts apart from maybe other biographies, perhaps? Anything you can think of? Okay, different perspective, the same event. It's true we read biographies. I mean, I've read several biographies of people like Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and the different biographers often have a different slant or different perspective, okay? See that in the gospel accounts, okay? The big difference is that they're not, it's not like uh, a modern art author like writing the life story of you know, someone in the past, like their actual witness accounts. I think that's like one of the big differences that separated it. It's not a, it's not like, a, I'm sorry, my okay. mind's yeah. okay. not working this much. Right. But yeah, in some, in some cases, the biographies that are written today are written about people who have died some time ago when they're doing historical background and trying to research and stuff. But the um, accounts of Jesus, the gospel accounts, often were written, not all of them, were written by somebody who were eyewitness to these events. They were there. Okay. So good. Um, in the gospels, whatever is commanded, we're expecting to keep. Another biography that's not there. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things about biographies, it's mainly just for maybe entertainment or learning purposes, but the gospel accounts, it's meant to teach us something, right? Uh, something to teach us and something for us to do as well. Okay. So, there's differences there. Okay. Anything else? As you read them, you can see that each one is kind of targeted for the different audience. Okay. Yeah, each one seems to have a different target. And that's what we're going to talk about, you know, why we've got four. Okay. All right. Something else maybe that's different about the gospel as opposed to as we've talked about typical biographies. 
how much background do we have on Jesus and his upbringing in the gospel accounts? We've got his birth in a couple of accounts. We've got one instance where he's 12 years old in the temple. But beyond that, we don't really know anything about him until he starts his ministry at about age 30. We don't have as much baby as a lot of other biographers would have, that type of thing. But there's probably a reason for that, right? The Gospels, that we've kind of already pointed out, are meant for us to do something. But they're also meant for us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, okay? They're meant much like a biography, and they uh, contain information about what he did and what he said. But there's also a different purpose. And we've got four different ones. So we're going to take a look at why four and what are the differences that will help us both in understanding them, but also as we share with other people, one might be better to talk to people than another one for different reasons. Okay. So let me get this back up here. All right. Everybody can see that. Okay. Get my little pointer going here. Yes, I need that. All right. So we're going to talk about why there's four gospels, right? So just kind of quick background, some stuff we've kind of covered already about the Bible itself. We recognize this is a message for all people for all time, right? The Bible. It has a focus, it has a theme, it has a purpose. I mean, you can kind of call it whatever you want, but there's a there's it's very important, the Bible is, right? It's it's God's message to mankind for salvation. So this is the overall theme we've been looking at for a week. But the message, I mean, and we recognize too, at least hopefully we do, that we have result and fail to recognize the authority of God's word in our lives. We fail to see that what God has spelled out, he's the creator. He's, he made us and everything around us. He knows what's best for us to live this life. And we live according to his word, things go well. And when they don't, we got problems, right? And a lot of people, they fail to recognize that. We've already kind of alluded to the gospel to help us to do, right? Um, but more than that as well, we also see there's other problems that occur when we don't rightly understand what's written. One of the reasons we've got so much differences in the larger Christian community today is we don't always understand it the same, right? And part of what we want to do in this class is help us to how do we properly understand these things? God wrote it for a reason. He's got something in mind we wrote it, and we need to try and figure that out what it is and live by it, okay? All right. So it's also, if we don't understand the why of his word, we might miss the most important message of all, okay? What is his purpose? Why did he write these things? Why are they recorded? So why did he write the Bible, especially the New Testament? What do you think? What's the purpose? Why do you write our salvation? Okay. Our salvation from what? Being saved from what? Sin. Sin. Yeah. Um, our sins have separated us from God, um, caused us to spend eternity without God. God wants to spend eternity with us. And so we need salvation. We need to be saved. And we recognize through his word, we can't do it ourselves. Okay. So. So we have four gospel accounts. We talked about this last week and the week before. Gospel meaning what? Good news. Good news about Jesus, right? Okay. So why do we have four? Um, this is going to be kind of our fundamental question for today. Okay. All right. So if we look at the entire Bible again, uh, there's really one kind of central purpose that we can write at the top of every page. I mean, if you thought about the overall message, what's God's purpose in writing and recording all this? Do you think? We talk about salvation. Someone is coming. Okay, someone is coming. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we see that from beginning to end. Someone is coming. That someone was Jesus the Christ, and he's coming again. Right. Uh, so we see that. Okay. But we see God's reaching out to man. Right. Um, we wouldn't know much about God without his word, right? So he's revealed himself and had this recorded, okay? And one of the themes or purposes of the Bible is missionary. He wants all people to be saved, not just people believing. He wants the message to be spread so all people come to knowledge of him and be saved. 
And so much of the New Testament then is written to, obviously written to Christians uh, to help instruct them on how they ought to live as Christians and believers. But when you think about the New Testament, you think about the Gospels, um, he reveals himself through Christ. He reveals his law. He reveals his desire. He reveals his plan. We see that starting the Old Testament and working up through the New Testament. God's revealing himself to us. And so he's reaching out to all men of all time with the missionary purpose of saving all who will come to him. Um, this is we've seen basically from the beginning. Now the Jews kind of had blinders on. They thought God's our, he's our, he's our God for us. But God was working through them trying to save all mankind. This was a message they sometimes didn't fully comprehend. Uh, here's what one writer put it. God is walking through every page of the Bible looking for man, just as he walked to the Garden of Eden looking for it. You know, uh, God's always looking for man and looking to save him. Okay? And the Messiah has arrived. That is Jesus. He, we see him as the Messiah. Okay? And we've looked at this too. The Old Testament spoke of, promised that there would be this Savior, this Messiah, this Christ to fulfill all these prophecies. Okay? And we've looked at some of those prophecies in the past, okay? And the New Testament looks, proclaims their fulfillment, okay? okay? So we have these four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, good news, right? Written by four different evangelists. Um, this is another form of the same word gospel, right? They're speaking the good news, proclaiming the good news, okay? And we're proclaiming one gospel. I mean, there's one Jesus, but we've got four different accounts of his ministry, okay? And again, as we talked about, they're not purely biographical. There's definitely biographical material, but if you think about it, they're really for open evangelistic purposes, okay? For people to come to an understanding of who Jesus was and believe in him. This is really kind of their ultimate purpose, okay? And so they've got good news. They want to tell it. Okay. All right. Um, so the intent of the gospel, written by four different men, was to make us all missionary in our focus. In other words, we're to be gospelers, if you will. We're to be God to find the good news. Okay. This is kind of what we're trying to get across. Okay. You know, and we think about four different gospels. I mean, if we if four of us in this room sat and watched the same accident occurred out there and, and the police come around and ask you to give an account we probably each have a little bit different information of the same event because maybe one person saw the driver of the car somebody else saw the pedestrian got hit somebody else saw you know another car over there that had to <laughs> break and we, it's all part of the same story but we see different aspects of it in the gospel we'll see some of that as well but it's all trying to tell the same story about jesus and help us to be missionary minded so let's take a look at the Gospel of Matthew. Who was Matthew? Tax collector. He was a tax collector. Okay. So he was a Jew, but he's collecting taxes for who? The Romans. The Romans. Okay. Uh, the, the Jewish tax collectors were not looked upon very favorably by their fellow Jewish men because they were collecting tax for the oppressors. Uh, but he was a tax collector. But he was also what? What was the relationship to Jesus? An apostle. He was an apostle. He was called by Christ to be an apostle, to be one to be sent. Okay. So he was with Jesus. He's one of these witnesses we we're talking about earlier on, right? He spent his whole that three years with Jesus. Okay. So he saw these events. So he's a witness to him. He's a Jew. Okay. So what perspective do you think he would write from? Um, Jewish, right? Jewish, yeah. yeah, he's Jew. And so he's writing from a Jewish perspective, right? Okay. And so when we think about the Gospel of Matthew, its, it's primary focus is trying to reach the Jewish mind of that day. If you think about when Christianity began, it spread, first of all, to the Jews in Jerusalem, Judea, and into Samaria. Then it got, got to the Gentile people. But Jews were one of the first people to be brought into the Christian faith. And Matthew's primarily targeting those Jews, helping them to understand, okay? So it's been the first place in our listening to each other books of the second century. People have always put that one first. That was not necessarily the first one to be written, but it does form a perfect link between the Old and New Testament. 
because he harkens back to the Old Testament so much. Yes. Now, Matthew's message was Jesus the Messiah to the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is the Messiah to the Jews. That's what they were looking for. That's what they're expecting. And so his message helps them to see that he is that fulfillment. Okay. Um, so it's primarily to a Jewish audience. Doesn't mean other people don't get anything out of it, but the, the primary audience appears to be Jewish. Okay. And, and we see that when we look at how he wrote this, you can see this, right? He talks about the opening verse. This is the family history of Jesus Christ. He came from the family of David. David came from the family of Abraham. He lists the genealogy of Jesus going back to David and back to Abraham, to whom the promises were made, right? The Jews, they kept the genealogies. Why did the Jews keep the genealogies? Couple of probably pretty important reasons. Do you know who the priests are? Okay, no, for, for specifically, you know who the priests were, the Levites, right? Okay. Well, what else? Well, uh, property that? disbursement. What's that? Property disbursement. Okay, property disbursement. Okay. You know who who were the rightful owners of lands going down to time, okay? They knew who was uh pure Jew and who was okay. who was yeah, who was pure Jew, okay. All right. Bloodline of Christ. Bloodline of Christ was the other thing, right? Had to be a descendant of David, had to be a descendant of Abraham. So they tracked all those, and the descendant of Judah, they tracked all those, the descendant of David. They're tracking these things, right? They wanted to make sure as my side show up, they could track it and make sure he's fulfilling all these prophecies. So Matthew opened with this and showed that Jesus comes from that. Okay. So that's you know, the Jews would be expecting that, right? Okay. So this would be very important to the Jewish mind, all right. But we also notice within this, um, his book, that he uses a lot of Old Testament quotes, right? Um, for example, in chapter 1, verse 22, Matthew, make clear the full meaning of what the Lord has said through the prophet. And then he goes on and quotes the prophet, okay? Or in the town of Bethlehem in Judea, the prophet wrote about this. This is when the Magi came and they were asking on the hair of death, so where is this Jesus supposed to be born? Where is the Christ supposed to be born? And he said, Judea, back Bethlehem, Judea. That's what the prophet wrote about. And so Matthew is recording these the fulfillment of these prophecies the Jews would have been familiar with. Um, John the Baptist, the one Isaiah the prophet was talking about in Matthew 3 3. Okay. Uh, it was written about John in the scripture, Matthew 11 10, quoting Malachi 3 1. Okay. And then Jesus answered in 19 4, surely you have read in the scriptures that Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament. And several times throughout Matthew, he quotes the Old Testament, or he refers to the prophecy of the Old Testament. Okay? The Jewish mind would have been familiar with these things, so it makes sense that if he was speaking to a Jewish mind, these things would be in there. Okay? Matthew uses more Old Testament than any of the other gospel writers. So if you're wanting to, if you've got somebody that's wanting to look at does it fulfill prophecy, Matthew's a good gospel to go to. Because he clearly outlines a lot of these prophecies and refers back to them many, many times. Okay, more so than the other ones. Again, showing that this is um, for the Jewish mind. There's actually 40 direct quotes. I mean, that'd be impressive to the Jewish mind. There's at least 40 quotes, not just one or two, but a whole bunch of them. Okay, so this is why we can, you know, attest the fact that the account of Matthew is primarily for a Jewish mind. Right. Um, so really, it was trying to reach them and make believers with the missionary heart that this Jesus is the Christ. It's the one you've been looking for, the one they expected. You don't need to look for another. Okay. Questions about Matthew? Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you're going to get into it between Matthew and Luke, but the differences in the genealogy. Yes, we will get there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Matthew clearly um, traces the lineage from Joseph back through David. And then back to Abraham, okay? Um, he was part of that line, okay? And Luke, we'll get into that here in a few moments, okay? Okay, so the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is the second one. Uh, what do you know about Mark? What do you know about him? He was a cousin. Yeah, he was a cousin of Barnabas, okay? He's a traveling companion of, I think it was Peter and Paul at one point. But he yeah. got most of his information from Peter. Primarily, he was with Peter. Yeah. And Peter was one of the apostles, just like Matthew. And a lot of the information is from Peter. Okay. Um, but Mark also, we see him showing up 
uh, within the New Testament. He was a traveling companion of Barnabas' cousin of Barnabas, who was known as the son of encouragement, who actually traveled with Paul, the Apostle Paul. Um, so Mark is familiar with several of these early leaders. Uh, there's a reference in the book of Mark in the Garden of Gethsemane about a young man that lost his robe and ran out. And many people think that was Mark himself. He's referring to himself in that account. Yeah. So what is the point of that? It seems so random. It does seem somewhat random, but maybe it was to, you know, for Mark to say, yeah, I was there. You know, these things are not you know, being told out of the account. So yeah, it does seem like kind of a random event. Yeah. Um, so, so he's another one. He's a, he's familiar with these people. He knows of these events, even if he was not an apostle. Very possibly he was one of the disciples that traveled around with Jesus, but we don't know any of the details. But he writes an account. Okay, of Jesus, and again, largely based on um, things from Peter, but his work is really kind of oriented more towards the Roman mind of that day. Um, these would have been people, uh, he tells a lot of the same stories as Matthew, there's a lot of overlap between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we'll talk about here in a few moments, um, but he kind of used a different set of eyes, and so he sets it forth and kind of more suited for the Roman populace. Again, like look at the same acts by two different people. One person looking at one thing, somebody else looking at something else. And so Mark's looking at Jesus through maybe a different set of eyes and has a little bit different focus. Whereas Matthew was trying to use scripture and say Jesus will throw into the scripture. You think about the Romans, they didn't know the Old Testament. They didn't know the Old Testament law. They didn't know the prophecies. So that would be lost on them. It wouldn't be as effective in trying to reach them. But what kind of things do you think would help them, do you think? Well, the Romans were interested in power. Okay, certainly they were interested in power. Mark, he wrote that Jesus is the power of God. Okay, yeah, Mark wrote he was about the power of God, okay? All right, okay. Um, you know, Mark ultimately has the same message. There's a savior and it's Jesus, okay? But for the Roman, one of the things is power. What else? You think my keep scary things done, so, getting things done, yeah. Like all the things that he accomplished, like the Romans accomplished so much, so right? They, they were goal oriented, right? And they pushed through. Yeah, the Romans were goal oriented, action oriented. They wanted to get things done, okay. Um, and they see Jesus getting something done, okay, good, all right, excellent. Okay, anything else? What I've read in the history is that it was written primarily to Roman Christians. So yeah. that would be a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, and all the things that people have said, what are the Roman Christians anticipating in the future? They need the power of God because yeah. there's going to be some evil season. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So there was, you know, to Roman Christians and they needed the power of God in their lives. They're showing Christ has that power. Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So it's reaching out to a Roman audience. Okay. And we see this in the opening verse. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He opens up in this way, okay? Good news, the gospel, okay, and the Son of God. And you think about the Romans and the Greeks as well. They had many gods, right? They worshiped all sorts of gods. Um, but here they're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of one God, okay? All right. So Matthew again starts by giving the genealogical ties Mark goes all the way back to the true beginning, back to God. He's the son of God, okay? This is not just an ordinary man. Yes, he's a man, but his origins go back and his ties go back to God, okay? And for the Romans who believe in the power of these gods, this could be very influential for them, okay? It would have a very great impact on their mind. And, and Paul did something similar in the um, book of acts he looks at all these gods he saw set up and he said they're an unknown god he starts preaching to him about this living god and so this is similar to what mark is doing as well okay um and one of the things we can see that's different from matthew's account we can see where matthew would talk about what jesus did in mark's account he would begin to explain the jewish customs right um for instance, the Pharisees and all the Jews never eat before washing their hands in this special way. They do this to follow the teaching given to them by the great people who lived before them, Mark 7, 3. Matthew wouldn't need to do that because the Jews would understand that. But if you're writing to a Roman audience, 
We don't know about the Jews. So, so why do the Pharisees wash their hands? What? What are they doing? So Mark explains that. Okay. So this is part of what we can, how we can see that this was written to more of a Roman audience. Okay. Um, we also see in Mark 15, 42, this was preparation day. That day means the day before the Sabbath day. Okay. Um, so that again, explain the Jewish customs. All right. Um, so who would you need to explain Jewish and Aramaic terms and customs to? People who are non-Jews, right? Okay. And that's what he, he does. Well, okay. Gentiles. Yeah. Right. The Gentile people who are non-Jews, they would need those explanations. So Mark includes a lot of those. Okay. Right. Now, another thing we kind of talked about it already is the idea of the use of action, right? The Romans were people of action and they were busy. They stole the virtue of activity, getting things done. Okay. And so Mark writes them a brief. I mean, here's the shortest of all the gospel accounts, the shortest one, only 16 chapters. But it's bustling with the accounts of the Lord's deeds and teachings. I mean, it's just, to me, um, one of the reasons I like the book of Mark, this, to me, if they were to make a movie about Christ's life, I'd probably base off Mark because it's full of action, right? A movie's got action in it, right? And Mark is just full of that kind of stuff, okay? He's going here doing this, and it goes on and does this. Um, and so Mark includes a lot of that kind of stuff, which appeals to the Romans, right? Yes. There are many places in Mark where it says, and immediately. Exactly right. Yeah. The demon came out. Or whatever. Exactly. Yes. We'll see that. Okay. And in comparison, I didn't mention this in Matthew's account, but Matthew's account, he has a lot of the teaching and he has a lot of parables as well. A lot of parables and miracles in Matthew. When we look at the book of Mark, there's 19 miracles, but only four parables. And we know Jesus told a lot more than four parables, but there's only four in Mark. So he's talking more about Jesus' power, that action, right, we were talking about, okay? So if you want to know about what Jesus did, some of the parables or the miracles, look at the book of Mark. He records some that other accounts that don't. So a lot of action, okay? Um, and as Keith already mentioned, we see this expression used straight away or immediate, immediately 42 times, like, boom, you know, immediately or the next thing or straight away they did this, you know? It's full of action. Just he's constantly doing things. And that's the way Mark's book comes across when you read it, okay? Um, that's, again, why I like it. I said, if you make a movie, this would be a good one because it's full of action, right? Um, I mean, how many people are going to sit through a movie where you're just sitting there and, and doing a bunch of teaching, right? We like action. And Mark does that, okay? Then the other thing we've marked as well, the idea of power, right? The Romans, were the, they were the supreme power of the world of that day. They were in power. They were in control. They liked power, much as many politicians do. Um, and they wanted to keep in power. And so they gloried in that strength and they often used intimidation to get what they wanted. Um, they imposed their will upon other people, right? So power was very important to them, okay? But when you look at Jesus, he's powerful and all these miracles he does, he's demonstrating he's got power over everything, right? From raising people to dead, to healing sick people and blindness, all these kind of things, he got power, but he doesn't use the, intimidation tactics he doesn't use the same or scare tactics but we see it in the miracle he does record how he is merciful to people and takes pity on people and wants to help people so this would have been a different mindset for the romans but yet showing jesus was still in control okay um so he doesn't record hundreds of miracles he undoubtedly jesus did hundreds if not thousands of miracles but what he does show is he's got power over everything, you know, from walking on water to raising the dead to casting out demons. You name it, he did it, right? And Mark shows that, okay? Full of these, okay? Right. So when they look, the Romans look at love for power, Jesus shows the power of love. That over and over again, he shows he's got power over things, but it's because he loves people. And this is one of the things that comes across in Mark's gospel. Okay. All right. We know that the Bible has how many books in it? 66. Um, but do we remember that all but two of them, Luke and Acts, were written by Jews? Yeah, wow. yeah Luke was actually Greek. Um, but who was Luke? He was a doctor. He was a physician of his day. Okay. All right. And what was his relationship to Jesus? Did he have one? 
He's definitely not listed among the apostles. Um, we don't have any good record that he was one of the disciples following him, but he could have been. But where where does he show up? With the Apostle Paul. He shows up with the Apostle Paul. When you read through the book of Acts, you will see that oftentimes Luke's the writer because he identifies himself at the beginning of the book. And oftentimes in Luke, he'll in the book of Acts, he'll say we, indicating Luke was there with Paul doing these things. Paul was a great apostle. Paul had great revelation. And so Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, much like Luke, uh, Mark would have been one of Peter. So he had a lot of these uh, this background. But we also, when we um, see in the first part of Luke, it'll say he investigated these things. He was somebody who investigated, right? History. So he, he talked to the witnesses. He may not have himself been witness these things, but he talked to eyewitnesses to record these things, okay? And now we've already talked about Matthew going to the Jewish mind and Mark primarily to the Roman mind. Who do you suppose Luke might be written to? And the hint might be the type of person he was. Yeah, Greek. Right, yeah, he was a Greek. And so he would understand the Greek mind culture perhaps better than Matthew or Mark. And we see that his primarily appeals to the Greek mind. Luke is a, is a well-studied person. His language, his use of the Greek language is very highly skilled um, in appealing to a Greek audience that would have been educated. Um, so we see that, okay? Um, we've already seen that Matthew wrote to the Jewish, Mark wrote to the Roman, but Luke really kind of tells the same story, but now he addresses me a Greek or Gentile world, okay? Now, the Greeks, if you remember history, they were the ones, they were the world-dominating power before the Romans. Alexander the Great conquered you know, much of the known world back around 300 BC. They were in power for a couple of years before the Romans. Um, and Greek culture had basically permeated a lot of the world. A lot of people spoke Greek. They understood these things. And so the Greek mindset was a little bit different from the Roman mindset. And so Luke um, is called the beloved physician in Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. 14, well-educated intellectual Greek, as we've mentioned, okay? All right. And we've already alluded to this, too, that Acts and Luke are basically a volume one, volume two set of um, volume ones of Christ. Volume two is the Acts of the Apostle. But we find a unique feature found only in Luke's writings, both in Luke and in the book of Acts. We find a dedication that he has dedicated these and addressed them to a man named Theophilus. Don't know who this man was. He appears to be a Roman official of some sort. Um, and basically, Theophilus means lover of God. Um, so he was perhaps a believer. In fact, it appears that way because when Luke opens up, um, he will try and he mentions this, that this is man, want, he wants to know the certainty of things he believes, okay? If we look at the opening verses or opening sentences in Luke's gospel, it says, many have tried to give a history of the things that happened among us. They have written the same thing that we have learned from others. So Luke is putting himself with that. We learned these things from others. I'm not an eyewitness. The people who saw these things from the beginning and served God by telling people his message. I myself studied everything carefully from the beginning, your excellency. Okay. So he's not an eyewitness to all these things, but he's studied them, he's examined them, he's talked to eyewitnesses to write these things down. And he says, I write these things so that you can know what you have been taught is true, right? There's a lot of things going on around there that weren't true, but Luke is trying to make sure he's got an accurate history of what Jesus said and did, okay? All right. And the Greeks, they emphasize things like culture, learning, education. And they let, they're philosophers, right? A lot of our modern mathematics and science come from Greek base because they thought about these things, okay? So they are very much into this kind of a world, right? Um, so this kind of an introduction would appeal to them. This is somebody who's taken the time to examine these things, lay out a, you know, a factual account, appeal to their education, okay? So this would be appealing to them, okay? Now, we do see that Luke does give a genealogical record, right? Whereas Matthew traces genealogical record back 
to David and back to Abraham, which appealed to the Jewish mind, Luke traces this even further all the way back to Adam. So only that Jesus is a, a man from the beginning. All people descended from Adam, right? The Jews, they all descended from Abraham, right? But Luke takes it all the way back. Um, as we mentioned, though, if you look at Luke's account, um, it'll talk about the fact that um, it'll say that he is thought to be the son of, of Joseph. Uh, he married Mary, but we know the actual father is the Holy Spirit, okay? And in Luke's account, Luke chapter 3, um, in verse 25, it says, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old and began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mephat. And he traced him all the way back um, through David, through Abraham, and back to the son of God. But it appears that they've traced through Mary's line, and Mary was also a descendant of David. So whichever way you trace it, Jesus is a descendant of David and a legitimate heir to the throne. Okay. So by tracing him all the way back to Adam, this would give a more universal appeal. It's not just for the Jews. And this is one of the key things about the book of Luke. What is there? anything else you know about the book of Luke different from the other gospel accounts? Well, I've heard it said that. Luke's gospel is Jesus, the wisdom of God. Okay, the wisdom of God, okay, might be a good way to put this. Luke's appealing to people of an intellect, the wisdom, and he shows the wisdom of God, okay, good. More, more detail, more you know, detail. Yeah, explaining. Yeah, there's a lot more kind of some detail in explaining things and setting the scene and so forth, setting the historical events, okay. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Is it, it includes a lot more historical stuff. Like, you know, there's there's times when it would be like in the reign of this person when this was happening when this person was sitting at his seat. That would be all yeah. stuff, which is really helpful, especially for us going back looking through it, because you know we can look and we can see historically, you know, things outside the Bible we can look at to tie into that timeline. And go, hey, this is actually, you know, this is you know this is plausible. This could yeah. exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. Exactly. Matthew and Mark don't give us a lot of historical context for the events, but Luke does. I mean, he sets it in history and says, when this person was in power, this person over here, uh, we have that. And we can verify it then through other historical accounts. Yeah. Uh, Luke is considered a very great historian that he accurately wrote about what was going on. Okay. So a little different. Okay. And again, looking at the G Greek mind, this would appeal to them. These things are true and factual. Okay. But He's gone back and he's appealing to all men, not just the Jews, okay? Um, in the account, the birth account, in chapter 2, verse 10, the angels come to the shepherds and say, don't be afraid because I'm bringing you some good news. It will be a joy to all the people. While Jesus is the Savior, out of the Jewish line, it's a Savior for all people, right? This is a message that comes through Luke's account far more uh, fully than the other accounts that Jesus appealed to all men. Okay. Matthew is trying to appeal to the Jewish mind, Mark the Roman mind, but Luke really kind of appeals to all men, okay? Right. And, and we see this in several different ways, all men, right? We see him reaching out to people like social outcasts um, in chapter seven. Um, now we're gonna run out of time here, but I wanna, this is important to cover. In Luke chapter seven, verse 39 in particular, I just wanna take a quick look at some of these. Right. Luke chapter 7, verse 39. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Um, this is when Jesus was anointed by a sinful woman. Um, but Jesus, you know, did not cast her out with the other people. That he met with these people. They were drawn to him. He has the, the Good Samaritan account. Many people are very familiar with that. He talks about the Samaritan, which the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them. That's unique to Luke's gospel. The only place you'll find that. Tax collectors and sinners, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. This is an important aspect here. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. That's Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teacher of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
you know, Jesus was associating with people that Jews didn't want to have anything to do with. And here's Jesus eating with them. You know, wow, this was different. Okay. Um, then Lazarus, a desert deserted beggar in chapter 16. The lepers in chapter 17. The dying thief on the cross uh, in chapter 23. Many women and widows. I mean, women weren't considered to be of equal status with men, but Jesus associated with them, and they were important in his ministry. I mean, all these things would show that Jesus was concerned about all men, right? And again, most all of these are Jews, but yet it didn't, they could be outcast Jews, and yet Jesus was concerned about them, people of all stations, um, including women. So this was unique about Luke, okay? Uh, the Greeks were busy spreading their culture and language all over the world. Their intent was to better the lives of people. And so Luke's message would really appeal to them because they could see how Jesus appealed to these people and trying to make life better for them and showing them that his love, his salvation was for all men. Okay? So this is something that's different. Okay. All right. Um, so God cares for and will save the Greek in the exact same way in which he cared and saved the Jew. There's no difference. Paul in the book of Romans is trying to explain that same thing. Um, but Luke's trying to get that message off. This is for all people, right? Not just the Jews. So God wants his message salvage spread it, and it's up to us to spread that message. Okay. And this is what we see in these gospel accounts. Okay. All right. Well, we're out of time for today. So next week we'll take a look at the gospel of John, and then I want to come back and look at um, the resurrection of Christ. But hopefully you found this helpful. Let's go to our Heavenly Father and we'll close with prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we are again grateful for the gospel accounts that have been written to help us to see Jesus in many different ways, to see him as the savior of the world, the fulfillment of prophecy, the one who loves all people and has the power to save us and to provide for our salvation. May the, the things that are written here help us to encourage and inspire our faith we would not falter, but also help us to reach out to people who do not know you, to find means and ways to help them to see uh, your salvation to come to a knowledge and understanding and the belief in you. And may we continue to use your word aright. And may we always strive to glorify you. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.